The structure of a material largely determines how it behaves uh, in response to some sort of stimulus, for example, a force. Structure, of course, has many different scales, uh, ranging from atoms to engineering dimensions. Now, one way in which we can control the structure of a material is by exploiting phase transformations in which we can induce changes in the way in which atoms are arranged. Now, in order to control the structure of materials, we need to understand the atomic mechanisms of phase transformations. But there are many puzzles. And I'll start by showing you this picture, which was taken fairly recently in the Antarctica, where you see large chunks of ice in uh, oceanic water. Now, you can imagine that the ice is fairly homogeneous and is a, it's a phase. In other words, we can pick it out and physically isolate it. And similarly, the water is another phase. Um, it has a different chemical composition. It's very rich in salt, whereas the ice which forms from the water when the temperature drops is actually almost pure. Okay, it contains very little salt. Now, the first puzzle that I want to leave you with, and we won't solve it today, is that no matter how long you observe that ice to be in contact with the salty water, there will be no tendency for the salt to homogenize between the two phases. Okay, even though the water contains a much greater concentration of salt than the ice, there is absolutely no tendency for the salt to diffuse from the water and enter the ice and for the concentration to become uniform everywhere. We will uh, answer that question after a few lectures. On the left of this slide, uh, you see a miner's lamp here. Okay? And a miner's lamp is a lamp designed so that you can take it deep underground and avoid the risk of an explosion if there happens to be inflammable gas in the mine. And it's made out of a really nice material known as brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc atoms. And if you look at this brass in detail in a, in a microscope, yeah, so here the scale is 100 micrometers, then it consists of two kinds of crystals. The Light yellow crystal has copper and zinc atoms randomly distributed on a face-centered cubic lattice. Okay. So this atom could be copper or zinc, but there's a random dispersion, so we can't identify that uh, uniquely. Uh, now, the second orange crystal uh, is much richer in zinc and is an ordered phase. In other words, the copper atoms are at the corners of this cube and the zinc atom at the middle of the cube, or vice versa. Uh, and the composition of the orange phase is much uh, richer in zinc than the yellow phase. And yet, when these are in equilibrium with each other, there is no tendency for the zinc to homogenize between these two structures. Essentially, the same problem, as I mentioned, for the salt uh, between ice and seawater. Now, so far, I've talked about two kinds of phases. Uh, a liquid phase, you know, the seawater, and solid phases like ice with its particular crystalline structure. And in this case, uh, in the case of brass, we have the so-called alpha and beta brass. This is the alpha brass and this is the beta brass. So they are solid. And all the solid phases that we've discussed are crystalline. Uh, and the meaning of a crystal is that there is a periodicity in the arrangement of atoms. The 
periodicity is long range. So here, for example, is a crystal consisting of red and black atoms. And I can define a unit cell here, this square, which if I stack in three dimensions, uh, it will produce the entire crystal structure. So all I need to know is the positions of these atoms here to reproduce the positions of any number of atoms inside our crystal. And, you know, uh, this drill here is a crystalline material containing millions of small crystals. So the characteristic feature of a crystal is that there is long-range periodicity. In other words, I know that this black atom is going to be followed by a red atom and then followed by a black atom and then a red atom ad infinitum. So there are many examples of crystals which we will come across during the course of these lectures but there is also another class of phases which are amorphous. Okay. Amorphous means that the atoms are actually arranged at random even though the material is solid. I cannot define a unit cell in this kind of a structure. So to describe the positions of each of the atoms, I would need to have as many vectors as the number of atoms in our sample, which can be, you know, 10 to the power of 23. And one example of an amorphous material is a glass. So this is a glassy matrix out of which over time, some crystals of uh, cristobalite have grown. Now, the glass has no long-range periodicity, whereas the crystal, of course, will have long-range periodicity. And window glass that we commonly encounter is an amorphous material, and it's one of the reasons why it's completely transparent, uh, because if it was crystalline, then the interfaces between the crystals would scatter light. Okay. So the glass would appear foggy uh, or even opaque if it crystallizes fully. Uh, and the story is that if you go to an old church uh, where you know the window glass is really, really old, then there might be a level of crystallization of the glassy silica into uh, something like cristobalite. Now, the other thing that I'd like you to note very carefully is that a crystal is necessarily anisotropic. Uh, anisotropic means that properties, spacings, etc. change with direction. So, for example, the spacing between atoms in this direction is not the same as the spacing between atoms in this direction. Okay. Furthermore, uh, the properties will be different if you measure them along this direction compared with this direction. So the inherent feature of a crystal is that it is anisotropic and there is no possibility of finding a crystal which is isotropic. Here, however, because the atoms are arranged at random, uh, the properties of an amorphous material will be the same in all directions. So, so for example, this glass will have the same uh, strength in all directions. Now, we can exploit the fact that an amorphous material is isotropic. So here I'm illustrating a method of producing metallic glass. In other words, a phase in which the atoms are located at random positions. It's a solid and it behaves like a metal. It has a, a, a bonding with free electrons. Okay. In other words, if I, if I change the positions of atoms, I don't need to disrupt the bonding. Metallic bonding means you have an electron gas holding the atoms together. Now, the way in which we make metallic glass is you take liquid uh, metal, molten metal, and you pour it onto a rotating water-cooled copper wheel, 
giving you a cooling rate of the order of uh, you know a million degrees centigrade per second. So given that large cooling rate, the atoms cannot have sufficient time to crystallize and therefore the metal actually forms as a glass. Right? Glass in the sense that it's a solid but the atoms are arranged in a random array rather than a periodic array. Now the advantage of metallic glass over say crystalline metal is that its properties will be isotropic. Right? So this, this actually contains no structure. If you examine it in a microscope it would appear homogeneous with no grain boundaries because there are no crystals and so forth. Now what that means is that if we have magnetic domains inside our material then they will be able to move easily backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And of course a transformer uh, has uh, you know um, alternating uh, voltage and therefore you know when the magnetic domains move backward and forward in a crystalline transformer you are losing some energy because the boundaries find it difficult to move across a microstructure. In this case there is no microstructure, so this is called a soft magnetic material. Uh, and you could make a transformer which doesn't heat up very much, uh, nor does it uh, lose a great deal of energy. So there are applications of metallic classes. Uh, solid metal with an amorphous distribution of atoms, a random distribution of atoms. Now, so far, uh, when discussing uh, crystals, uh, I focused on uh, solid crystals, uh, where we have an uh, ordered array of atoms, or in this case, anisotropic molecules. So this is a solid crystal with clear long-range periodicity. And in this case, we are dealing with molecules which are long. The same structure can be a liquid, uh, and even in its liquid state, there is some semblance of order here. So this is known as a liquid crystal. It's known as a liquid because, you know, a liquid can flow. And the formal definition of a liquid is that a liquid cannot support a shear stress, right? So these liquid crystals are used in electronic displays. So for example, if I put this liquid on a glass slide which has longitudinal grooves then the molecules will tend to align along those grooves okay but then if i apply an electrical field i can cause them to rotate outside of the grooves perhaps at 90 degrees and therefore you can change the contrast that you get uh, from the display by certain features so Liquid crystal displays work by changing the orientation of these molecules by applying electrical fields. And you know, if you press on your computer screen, you'll see that the image actually distorts. And that's because if there is liquid inside your screen in the form of liquid crystals, then that will flow under the influence of your mechanical uh, force. So crystals can be liquid as well as uh, solid uh, and there is no example in existence that I know of and I'm pretty sure uh, of gaseous crystals. Now if you talk to a lay person then their vision of a crystal is that it has a beautiful form. Uh, for example, these are quartz crystals which are grown over a very long period of time and therefore their shape is determined by the minimization of surface energy rather like you know a, a bubble in, a, in water will assume a roughly spherical shape because that gives you the minimum surface energy per unit volume. So because these crystals have grown over a long period of time, 
they have nicely faceted shapes uh, which reflect uh, a minimization of surface energy. And of course, uh, the vast majority of crystallography that we deal with today was determined by looking at the shapes of these crystals which have grown under close to equilibrium conditions because the shape reflects the internal atomic arrangement to some extent. But you know, uh, crystals need not look like this. Okay? We can make crystals which have an engineering function. And this, for example, is a single crystal turbine blade which you'll find in all aircraft engines that, uh, uh, that exist. So basically, these single crystal turbine blades, they serve in the hottest part of the aircraft engine, which, is, uh, which has an environment of about 1500 degrees centigrade, which is greater than the melting point of this material here, which is called the nickel-based superalloy. And I'll explain how it can operate in such a hot environment and still remain solid. So the way in which you make this single crystal, and obviously it's got aerodynamic shape. We, we, we don't really want the equilibrium shape. This is a functional form. So the way in which you make this is you solidify directionally, starting from here and then going upwards. So you get many crystals uh, nucleating and then growing, but the one that grows fastest makes it through this spiral and the rest of this solidifies as a single crystal. Now, why do we want a single crystal? Well, if we actually have many crystals inside our blade, then there will be boundaries between those crystals which are a little bit uh, lower density than the rest of the crystal. That means that atoms can move about easily in the boundaries, and therefore, when this is rotating at something uh, like, uh, you know, thousands of uh, revolutions per minute in a very hot environment, the blade will tend to get longer and that's, that's no good. It will hit the engine casing. So, to minimize that diffusion along boundaries, we make the blades as single crystals. Okay? And this is routinely produced uh, in mass. Now, the way in which this operates in a very hot environment is that inside this blade there are cooling channels which carry air at 600 degrees centigrade and therefore they keep this below its melting temperature and there is also a, a coating known as a thermal barrier coating. Uh, it's quite a complicated coating but essentially it's a ceramic uh, which uh, limits the amount of heat that can go into the blade. So amazing technology, routinely implemented. So crystals need not have a, a beautiful sh shape as perceived by a layperson. I find this particular shape extremely pleasing because it is aerodynamic and yet the whole thing here is a single crystal. Now, to emphasize that uh, you know, the properties of a single crystal are anisotropic, you grow this single crystal in such a way that the modulus is stiff in the horizontal directions and therefore the blade does not vibrate much during operation. Okay? So we take advantage of the anisotropy of properties to minimize the vibrations of the blade during service. And just to show you how the elastic modulus can vary dramatically as a function of the direction. Uh, this is for silver, where we are plotting the modulus, and you can see it's highest along the body diagonals of the single crystal uh, unit cell. And in the case of moly, uh, molybdenum, it's highest along the cube edges of the unit cell. So these are both cubic materials. This is body-centered cubic, and this is face-centered cubic. So, Anisotropy is a really important property of single crystals which you can exploit or it can be a nuisance as well sometimes in the case of uh, making transformers.
Now, of course, this course is about phase transformations. That means changes from one kind of a phase to another uh, in the solid state, in the liquid state, etc. So a transformation has a very simple definition. It is a change in the atomic arrangement. So I, I will have one phase with a particular atomic arrangement. I want to transform it into the other, another phase with a different atomic arrangement. How does that happen? Well, there are two essential mechanisms by which this can happen. The first is by breaking all the bonds and making new ones in the different pattern. Okay. So that obviously requires quite, quite a lot of flow of atoms. And the second one is we deform the pattern into a new shape. And of course that doesn't require any diffusion. Uh, but when you deform something, you will also get a change in shape. So I'll, I'll illustrate that uh, schematically first and then with real examples. So imagine that we have this crystal here and uh, you know it has two kinds of atoms and this is a stiff container here containing this crystal. So in the mechanism where we break all the bonds, okay, so we make a huge pile of uh, all the atoms and the bonds and then we reconstruct it inside the container uh, into a different pattern. So you can see that the unit cell here is not identical to this. But in doing this, you know, we've broken all the bonds and rearranged the atoms, you will lose atomic correspondence. That means this atom here was next to this one here, and we don't have that in the transformation product. Okay, so atoms will move into locations which they were not there originally. But uh, there is no real change in shape of the container because if the material can flow then the atoms will flow in such a way that they do not cause any strain on the container itself. So this is a mechanism which we call reconstructive transformation where we take the crystal and we reconstruct it into a different pattern allowing the flow of atoms by diffusion. So in contrast this is a displacive transformation mechanism. So imagine you have this pattern here, which is an oblique uh, parallelogram. I can shear that into a square by putting a shear stress this way. So look uh, here, I've changed it into a square pattern. And the problem is that we cause a change in shape okay, of the crystal. So the crystal had a certain shape and now it's changed into another shape and it's pushing against this container, rigid container. So these atoms, uh, I've drawn them outside the container, but they will remain inside and the bonds will be compressed. So the key feature <coughs> of a transformation like this is that it will cause a lot of strain, okay? A lot of strain associated with this transformation because it's pushing against either the container or the crystals other crystals which surround it. We call this a displacive transformation mechanism because we are displacing the atoms into their new positions and we are not changing the near neighbors. Okay. So uh, the composition of this will be identical to this. There is no diffusion. And to illustrate it, uh, displacive transformations in a different way, uh, you know, here again we have a mixture of red and white atoms with a particular unit cell and the transformation, this is a partly transformed sample, this hasn't changed but this region has with a new unit cell uh, and notice that the atomic positions are identical here apart from very small, uh, you know, displacements. So Given that this pattern changes in shape, the external shape of the crystal must also change. And that's illustrated by this oblique uh, shape corresponding to the oblique pattern of atoms. And this looks like a very large strain. So 
typically, you know, uh, an elastic strain in a loaded piece of steel is, uh, say, 200 megapascals applied stress, and the modulus is about 200 gigapascals, so the strain is 0 0.001. I'll show you later that these strains are of the order of 0 0.26, so much, much larger than during the elastic loading of a material. So displacive transformations are dominated by the shape change and the associated strain energy because this crystal might be pushing against a container or other crystals surrounding it. To illustrate that again, we start with a, a square pattern of atoms and um, uh, we, we need to change that pattern in order to transform it into a different crystal structure. <clears throat> and you can see that we've now got an oblique pattern, but the consequence is that we've also changed the external shape of the crystal. Okay, so that's very important to realize. So, so far I've only shown this shape change uh, schematically, but in fact, if I take the parent crystal, uh, you know, which is going to transform into a product, and I polish it organically flat, and then observe it as transformation happens, then you will pick up these deformations that I've illustrated schematically. So, so here is a sample which was polished organically flat, okay, and. Uh, what we want to do is um, observe it as the material cools. And you can do that using something called a confocal laser microscope. And look at this, okay? So as the transformation happens, the surface changes into something that looks like a mountain range, all right? So these are the same shear displacements that are illustrated schematically happening in real life, okay? So you can see these phase changes happening in front of your eyes and you need to regard a displacive transformation as not something which simply changes the crystal structure but which also uh, causes a physical deformation, okay? And that deformation you can see in front of your eyes. Now, of course, if I now reverse the temperature or whatever is inducing this transformation, then it should be possible to get rid of this shape change and for the sample to become flat again. So I'll illustrate that with another movie here, where it's a particular material uh, in which we can magnetically induce a phase transformation. Okay, so look. First we apply a, a magnetic field and cause a phase change with the upheavals that we saw in the earlier movie, massive upheavals. And now we reverse and you can see that the sample becomes flat again. Okay, So it's a beautiful example of uh, reversible phase transformations. Now, of course, if, uh, if you noticed, all the transformation products are in the form of thin plates, all right, when, when it's a displacive transformation, uh, especially if there is a large shear. And I'll have to explain to you why these things form as thin plates later on. But we need to ask the question, you know, if a displacive transformation is causing such a lot of strain energy, then why does it happen in the first place? Because an equilibrium transformation involving diffusion and the flow of matter uh, does not have that strain energy. Why do displacive transformations happen at all? Now, the reason is that sometimes the transformation is induced in circumstances where the atoms cannot move significantly. All right? So, situations where there is a low atomic mobility. So one condition for diffusionless growth, displacive transformation, is that the interface velocity must be greater than the diffusion coefficient divided by the interatomic spacing, because this 
is the velocity with which an atom can jump from one side to another. As you know, d has units of meter squared per second and lambda meter. Therefore, if I divide this by this, I have a velocity here, meter per second. And this is the speed with which the interface advances. If the interface advances faster than the diffusion velocity, then we will get a displacive transformation. <clears throat> so, um, in the previous movie, we could see nicely the plates growing. And of course, we can then measure their growth velocity, V. And we do this here. So this is uh, uh, when we observed the field of view was approximately 20 micrometers in length. And the movie was recorded uh, showing that the plate grew across in 24 milliseconds. Okay, uh, so uh, the velocity of growth is 20 micrometers divided by 24 milliseconds, which gives us 8 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. That's the velocity. And in this particular material, uh, which was observed at 300 Kelvin, the diffusion coefficient is about 10 to the minus 15 meters squared per second. And the interatomic spacing is two angstroms. So the diffusion velocity is 5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters per second. So obviously the growth velocity is two orders of magnitude greater than the diffusion velocity. And therefore, we get displacive transformation. Okay. Now, I explained earlier that the shape change that is caused by a displacive transformation causes huge strain energy because you know you might get a shear strain of the order of a quarter which compares with an elastic strain of a loaded steel structure of just 10 to the minus 3. Now how can we measure the strains associated with a transformation? Well we polish a sample completely flat, organically flat, and then we allow the transformation to happen and we can measure the displacements very accurately using a technique known as an atomic force microscope. Okay. So this is uh, the sort of image you can generate of the surface topology using an atomic force microscope. Uh, and the way in which this works is that there is a needle which keeps a constant distance from the surface, uh, whatever its height is, because there's a tunneling current uh, which feeds back to its, the needle control to keep it at a constant height. Therefore, as it traverses the specimen, you know, you pick up the topology of the surface. And you can see these massive shears caused by the growth of these transformation products, <coughs> which are in the form of thin plates. And when we measure the shape change accurately, okay, it can be of three different kinds. One is that you just get a uniaxial dilatation, that means uh, just a volume change, right? and this plane remains unchanged. And this uh, is the sort of uh, deformation that we get uh, when we get displacive transformation in barium titanate, which I'll come to later. And then we might have a, a shear deformation, okay, but this is a shear strain, this is a volume strain. Or we might have a combination of a volume change and a shear strain. So this is known as an invariant plane strain. That means it leaves a plane unchanged but there is a shear and a dilatation associated with it. And when we do accurate measurements we find that the shear strain is of the order of a quarter whereas uh, the volume change of course depends on what we are transforming but typically it's of the order of three percent, much smaller than the shear strain. And I've uh, given you hand-waving arguments that this will cause a huge amount of strain energy, but we need to calculate that strain energy. So I'm going to start <clears throat> with a simple analogy of a tensile stress being applied in the Hooke's law region, in other words, uh, in the elastic regime of deformation. So uh, this is a shear stress, this is a shear strain, and in the Hooke's law regime, we get a straight line, 
and the area under this curve is half tau, half, half uh, the shear stress times the shear strain, uh, and that is the amount of energy per unit volume caused by uh, this level of strain. Okay, so this is the figure that I'm after, uh, and if I replace the shear stress by the shear modulus times the shear strain, then that's equal to half mu gamma squared. The half is simply there because we are looking at the area of a triangle for an elastic strain. If it was a plastic strain where, you know, we have uh, a straight line here, then the half would be missing, okay? So what I wanted to grab from this simple illustration is that the strain energy per unit volume which will scale with the modulus, the stiffness of the material, and with the square of the strain involved, right? So very important to note this, that this is the modulus and this is the square of the strain. Now, to work out the strain energy associated with a transformation which grows in the form of a thin plate is really complicated using Eschel based theory. So I'm going to give you a result. And here it is, that the strain energy per unit volume for a plate forming is, again, it scales with the shear modulus, and it scales with the squares of the strain, as it did with our simple example. But there is an additional term, which is the thickness over the length of the plate. Okay, thickness over the length of the plate. So, this term, I haven't explained how that originates, because it's beyond the... Uh, remits of this course. It involves Ashelby theory, which requires a lot of training. But what it says is that if the plate is thinner, then the strain energy is reduced. Okay. Uh, so, of course, we want to transform the material. So, we do not want an infinitely small strain energy um, by making the thickness zero because there will be no transformation. So what happens is that there is a strain energy term and there is a stimulus which drives the transformation and that stimulus has to provide the energy, the strain energy. So the two of them balance and that determines the thickness of your plate. Now I've given you examples of uh, displacive phase transformations in a variety of uh, materials. I'm now going to show you that it can also happen in biological systems. So this is a schematic illustration of a virus. And imagine that this is its head and these are its arms. And there is a cylinder here which operates so that the DNA from here and we inject it into a bacterium where it can multiply. And in the process, you know, the virus actually dies because it's not left with any DNA. But its method of reproduction is to infect something with its DNA. But the question is, you know, how does this injection work? How does this long, thin cylindrical crystal change into a short, fat crystal? And when you look at the arrangement of atoms on that long thin crystal, it looks like this. Uh, this scale here is 10 nanometers. And after the hypodermic needle has operated, uh, it's a different pattern. Okay, So this is actually a phase transformation of a cylindrical crystal. And that is what operates the displacive transformation, operates the hypodermic needle for the virus. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that we need to think about displacive transformations as not just a change in crystal structure, but also a physical deformation. And this is a sterling example of that, that you've got a change in crystal structure and the physical deformation is being exploited to puncture the bacterium or, or whatever cell the virus wants to infect. So, to summarize, oh, sorry, uh, this is a, a optical images of the virus doing its business on a bacterium. Okay. So this is a real example 
Now, to summarize, you know, the, one of the fundamental conditions for displacive growth, displacive transformation, is that the interface must move faster than the velocity by which atoms can diffuse over an interatomic distance, okay, because that's the smallest jump distance. And we have seen that the strain energy associated with these transformations will in general cause the transformation product to grow in the form of thin plates. And this is a beautiful example of uh, displacive transformation in steel to produce something called martensite, which Haishu uh, is going to describe in one of his lectures. Uh, these plates that you see have uh, transformed from the parent, uh, parent phase into arrays of extremely thin plates which are very very strong okay so almost all of the very high strength steels that we use you know and we use vast quantities of steels have a microstructure consisting of these plates of martensite so you learn much more about this in a later lecture but it's a truly displacive transformation there's no diffusion whatsoever <clears throat> Okay, uh, I focused on displacive transformations. Reconstructive transformations are uh, those in which we achieve the change in the atomic arrangement by breaking all the bonds and rearranging it into a different shape, but keeping the external shape of the crystal constant, okay, apart from any volume change. So it's rather like, uh, you know, water solidifying into ice in an open container okay so there will be a small uh, change due to volume but the container remains a rigid container and because of the flow involved uh, there is little or no strain energy okay now I want you to imagine a reconstructive transformation slightly differently okay uh, there is obviously no shape change here and there is obviously diffusion and that diffusion need not be of solute atoms because during a reconstructive transformation all the atoms must be able to diffuse so even if I have a absolutely pure substance to get a, dis uh, a reconstructive transformation those atoms must be able to flow during the time scale of the experiment so you can imagine uh, a reconstructive transformation is breaking all the bonds and rearranging it to a different pattern. All right, no external change in shape apart from volume change. And not only that, but because there is the flow of matter, uh, atoms which prefer to be in the product phase will partition into the product phase. Okay, so we no longer have a uniform distribution of red atoms, uh, uh, they will go wherever they are happiest, okay? And I'll define what happiness means later. So we achieve the change in crystal structure, but there may also be a change in chemical composition. So the interpretation of a reconstructive transformation, you should think about it as like this. So this is our parent phase and this is our product phase. And here we have a displacive transformation. That means you've changed the crystal structure by a deformation. But there is a shape change, which we don't see in a reconstructive transformation. So we cut off this triangle and transport it onto this side to recover the shape. And this is the diffusion that you need during a reconstructive transformation. It's roughly over the length scale of your transformation product. Okay. Now, given that uh, there is very little strain energy involved, you know, only due to any volume change, uh, and even that might be reduced by flow. Um, the shape of the transformation product will no longer be as a thin plate, but as something which minimizes the overall surface energy. So, for example, you see these white carbides here. They look like blobs because, you know, just like uh, a bubble in water, they're trying to minimize their surface energy. Now, I've made this general statement that um, they will not be in the form of uh, thin plates, but it's not strictly correct because sometimes in order 
to get a good match between the atomic structure of the product and the parent, uh, it might be advantageous to have a flat interface, in which case you get particles which look like plates, but there is no shape deformation associated with them. Okay, I'll give you now an example of phase transformation being used in industry to create the world's first bulk nanostructured material. Okay, so this is heated to about a thousand degrees centigrade, large chunks of uh, particular steel, and then put into a, a salt bath at 200 degrees centigrade to achieve the transformation from this structure to this structure. And the change is so large in going from 1000 to 200 degrees centigrade that we end up with incredibly fine crystals inside this shaft. Uh, this is actually a shaft for an aircraft engine. And a shaft for an aircraft engine is made of steel. And it has many purposes and many, many requirements. But one of the requirements is that it must be able to plastically bend. Right now, why do we want that? Well, these titanium blades uh, are very large and during operation, they carry a huge amount of momentum. So if one of these blades breaks, it causes a massive vibration of the engine. Okay. Um, we've designed the engine so that uh, the debris is still contained inside the engine, so it doesn't hit the fuselage. But nevertheless, uh, we get violent vibrations if one of these blades breaks because the momentum is like lifting a mini car to a height of 10 meters. <coughs> now, to temporarily accommodate that uh, imbalance, the steel shaft can bend and allow you to shut down the aircraft engine. Okay, So the properties required here uh, is never just a single property. Okay, uh, you need a whole combination of properties to make something useful. And that is the reason why graphene has not succeeded in structural applications, because its strength only exists when it is very, very small. And furthermore, you need many more properties than just strength in order to make a useful component. So this particular transformation in the steel shaft is achieved by heat treatment. That means we started red hot and then went to a lower temperature where another phase is more stable. But you can also induce the transformation by a magnetic fields. And you, you saw that earlier in the movie that I showed of plates growing, uh, the reversible transformation. Uh, and the magnetic field of the Earth at its uh, equator is really really quite small okay it's a it's, it's of the order of um, 0.0003 tesla this is a unit of magnetism defined after nikola tesla who did nice work on the subject but in queen mary for example uh, we have a device where we can apply a magnetic field of three Teslas and study transformations and other features inside, inside this. Now, of course, this uses a massive amount of electricity to generate uh, the three Tesla. Uh, and there are facilities uh, elsewhere, uh, you know, for uh, one of these large facilities, where if you make a good scientific case, then you can use the equipment where we can go up to 12 Teslas as well. So you can induce transformation by altering temperatures, altering magnetic fields, applying a, a sufficiently large stress, etc. But we need to follow these transformations as they happen and also answer these basic questions that why does a change in temperature sometimes cause a change in phase uh, or another kind of a stimulus such as a magnetic field. We won't be able to answer that today, but we will deal with this in the rest of the course. 
but we need to follow the phase transformations to see that they've happened and what structures evolve. And one of the very common methods is to use uh, X-ray diffraction. So imagine that this is our crystal uh, and the planes of atoms are spaced by a uh, distance d and you subject it to X-rays and have a look at ray A which is from the surface and ray B which penetrates a little bit more and reaches the same front, wave front then wave B has actually traveled a greater distance than wave A to reach the same wave front. And this distance xy here, if you look at the geometry, is d and sine of the angle theta. So the path difference here is 2d sine theta compared with ray A. Now, if two rays have a different path difference, then they will interfere with each other. And they will interfere constructively only if 2d sine theta is an integral number of wavelengths. Okay, So the, um, we need the phase difference between the two rays to be an integral number of wavelengths. And that is where you know the Bragg equation comes from, that you get constructive interference when this is equal to an integral number of wavelengths. Okay. Uh, so, if you are off the angle theta, which satisfies this equation, the Bragg angle, then somewhere deep inside your material, you'll be able to find a, a ray which is half a wavelength out of phase, and you will get destructive interference at all angles other than those satisfying the Bragg condition. Now, you will be doing some X-ray diffraction experiments. And we have bought these two machines uh, specifically for this course, where we have uh, an X-ray tube which has a high vacuum inside, and electrons are accelerated either at 30 kilovolts or 20 kilovolts to hit a copper target and produce uh, a copper K alpha or K copper K beta uh, uh, radiation. This is where we put the sample, and this is our Geiger counter. Uh, which monitors the number of counts uh, coming out at uh, various two theta angles. These are filters that we put in front of the Geiger counter because we want to filter out the K beta, for example, and to improve the accuracy of uh, the measurement. Now, <clears throat> you can see here that uh, the tube, uh, tube is glowing. Uh, but all the x-rays shut off if you open the lid, all right? So during these experiments, uh, it will not actually be possible for you to open the lid, so don't try and force it open. And there will be demonstrators uh, around to make sure that uh, you don't do that. But if, for example, the lid is opened, then automatically the whole system shuts down okay and this is the counter by which we measure the output from the Geiger counter okay. so uh, we will be doing these experiments and everything here is manual so that you actually learn what's going on during the process um, for for that's really quite important because you know you don't want to just use data that uh, that are given to you but actually figure out how things work. For research purposes, where you've already learned the method, uh, there are uh, more sophisticated machines with higher intensities of x-rays. And this is now the shield, which if you open, will shut the system down. And uh, there are complex uh, manipulators inside there so that you can rotate your crystals in different ways and do really quite uh, interesting experiments okay so that's also available in uh, queen mary but sometimes we need to penetrate uh, a material which is you know a centimeter thick okay uh, and at the same time we want to monitor and get x-ray diffraction patterns every second because we are looking at a phase change happening etc and for this 
uh, we need a facility which costs billions of pounds. Okay, so this is the Grenoble synchrotron, and this is the synchrotron ring, which is about eight kilometers in circumference. And basically, you have a lot of superconducting magnets here, which accelerate electrons close to the speed of light. And because they're going in a curve, they emit uh, high energy X-rays, quite intense X-rays. And we, we sort of tap the X-rays at various positions in small laboratories located all around the circumference to do experiments. And this is one of those uh, small laboratories where we set up our equipment and uh, there is uh, when the x-ray source comes in into our sample we record everything quite rapidly uh, you know we can get full diffraction patterns in a matter of a second and we can build equipment to either heat or cool the sample or apply the stress or any other uh, facility that we need to implement okay now Facilities like these are very expensive, but they're free to use if you make a strong academic case for the experiment and if you make your work publicly available. Now, uh, just to revise uh, how, uh, how um, we can calculate the despacing of a crystal which has an orthogonal unit cell, that means the unit cell axes are, are angles of 90 degrees. Imagine that uh, this is uh, the plane of interest with Miller indices HKL and there's another plane uh, parallel to it passing through the origin. So this uh, distance between the two planes is the despacing, the spacing of the planes. Now from the definition of Miller indices, H is the reciprocal of the intercept of the plane with the x-axis. So this is the x-axis, the y-axis and the z-axis. So this uh, position is identified by the lattice parameter divided by H. This one by B, uh, the lattice, uh, uh, second lattice parameter divided by K, and the third lattice parameter divided by L. So from uh, simple geometry, you can see that this distance here uh, is cos of the angle phi A times D, and we can write similar equations for the other distances here. And rearrange, we get cos of phi a equals dh upon a, and so on. And if I square these uh, and add them, then cos squared phi a plus cos squared phi b plus cos squared phi c must equal to 1, because that's the, that's the nature of an orthogonal system, that the direction cosines uh, sum up to 1. And therefore, we get... The equation for d spacing as 1 upon d squared, when you rearrange this and square the whole lot, is h upon a squared plus k upon b squared plus l upon c squared. Now, when you have the d spacing, of course, you can work out the Bragg angles, the positions where you are likely to get uh, um, constructive interference of x rays. And this is an example uh, that I've put into your lecture notes where we have barium titanate, these are barium atoms, that's the titanium atom located exactly at the center, and these are oxygen atoms, okay? Now, this transformation is interesting, uh, this uh, crystal is interesting, it's cubic, but in, at temperatures below 120 degrees centigrade, it transforms into a tetragonal cell, that means the C-axis is longer than these two, which are equal. But uh, the interesting thing is that the titanium atom is no longer exactly at the center. It is displaced upwards by a significant amount. And that means that because these are all uh, charged ions, okay, we actually have a polar. We have developed polarity in this crystal of barium titanate. Uh, there is no longer a center of symmetry in this unit cell. And if we have this not located on a center of symmetry, then when I deform this crystal, I will also get a change in polarity, in other words, uh, a change in voltage. And if you calculate the despacings for the cubic sample, 
and let's say we are using copper K alpha radiation, then you should be able to calculate the Bragg angle for the 100 planes. Okay? And from that, you can see that 2 theta that we record on the X-ray equipment will be 21.98 degrees. And this is what the X-ray spectrum looks like with the 100 peak located at 21.98 degrees. <clears throat> now, this, this is simply showing the position of the peak. To calculate the intensities, we need to learn a lot more about X-ray. <clears throat> and we're not going to do that. The tetragonal form here has two different lattice parameters. And we will get two different 2 theta angles for the 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and the 0, 0, 1 phases. In other words, when we look at the X-ray diffraction peak, peaks, it splits into two. This is 0, 0, 1 and not the same as 0, 1, 0. And similarly, 1, 0, 1 is not the same as 1, 1, 0 because the C parameter is different. Okay. So we'll be looking at barium titanate uh, using our X-ray equipment, uh, but uh, the X-ray equipment does not have sufficient intensity uh, or resolution to pick up this splitting. What you might see is that the X-ray diffraction peak is no longer symmetrical because it consists of the superposition of two diffraction peaks slightly displayed, <coughs> the displaced. So, because uh, the properties of this crystal, uh, no center of symmetry, the fact that there is a polarity there uh, means that it's ferroelectric, okay? and it's also piezoelectric and pyroelectric. All of these stimuli will cause the development of a potential. And one of the first uh, applications of barium titanate was to convert mechanical vibrations into electrical signals, in other words, uh, uh, in this case, uh, a microphone. So here we have a barium titanate uh, crystal connected to a diaphragm uh, which will vibrate according to your voice and cause this crystal to flex, giving an electrical signal which can be amplified uh, to serve as a microphone. Uh, this is a, a much more recent paper that I read where you try and implant uh, uh, um, something with a coating of barium titanate. The idea being that uh, when you move about, you know, the electrical impulses from the barium titanate will stimulate the growth of natural tissue onto what you have implanted. Now, it's a clever idea, but the same people who did these experiments reached the conclusion that there is no difference between electrically stimulated and inactive implants. But you can see how a material like this can actually inspire you into many different uh, trains of thought. Okay? So just because uh, this particular experiment did not produce the required result, and that's the nature of research, um, it's an interesting idea. So materials actually stimulate all kinds of interesting ideas. I'm going to stop the lecture now. and. Uh, Thank you all for listening.